everyone, and welcome to the Recovery Housing Program Design and Implementation Webinar. Um, our agenda for today, first we will introduce you to your uh, primary presenters and go over the learning objectives for the webinar. Then we'll give the background on the Support Act and Recovery Housing Program funding, sort of the context that we provide at the beginning of every webinar. And then a very high level overview of the recovery housing program itself and how it's structured. And then we'll really dig into the meat of the presentation. We'll talk about you know, actions you need to take before beginning to develop your action plan, uh, drafting the action plan itself, um, and then what program implementation looks like in the abstract, and, um, and then some hypothetical program implementation examples. So I am Carrie Kronberg, as I mentioned, with ICF, and I have, um, I was with the grantee agency, state grantee agency for a long time with the state of Colorado and the Division of Housing, um, implementing state CDBG on primarily housing activities and also working in um, with other housing programs and homelessness. Um, and I also did a little of that at the local level in Sonoma County. Um, Chuck Creeman is my co-presenter. Chuck, do you want to introduce yourself? Good afternoon, Chuck Creeman here. Um, I've been doing uh, housing community development for uh, most of my adult life uh, at at HUD, and uh, for the last 15 or so years as a technical assistance provider with uh, ICF, uh, working all of the CPD programs, uh, CDBG, Home, and all the homeless programs as well. A uh, couple of uh, some work on a couple of HOPWA guides, as if you have some. Hop of people here. Uh, very interested in getting into the uh, recovery housing program aspect of it. it. It ties into some of my past experiences with the homeless programs and some of the projects that I've been associated with over the years. Glad to be with you. Thank you, Chuck. So the learning objectives for this webinar are after uh, joining us, you'll be able to follow the steps to develop your recovery housing program models that are appropriate for your community and also to complete the recovery housing program action plan. And then the second one is you'll be able to look at um, potential implementation strategy options and determine what works for you um, or what to evaluate to determine what works for you based in, on existing resources and capacity that exists within your state. So Support Act Overview, um, it was passed in October of 2018, and it was developed in response to the opioid epidemic. The Support Act authorized the Recovery Housing Program to aid grantees with providing stable temporary housing to individuals in recovery from a substance use disorder. Also statutorily, eligibility was defined as states and DC that um, have age-adjusted rates of drug overdose deaths above the national overdose mortality rate. And it is uh, based on the CDBG framework. There have been two appropriations of recovery housing program dollars. Um, first uh, was in 2020 at the end of that year. Um, or at the end of 2019 for the 2020 budget, um, 25 million, and there were 25 eligible grantees. Um, and then the 2021 budget passed at the end of 2020, appropriated a second round of 25 million, and that there, that has 27 eligible grantees. Um, a few were added and one fell off um, because the data um, that the uh, formula is based on changed and eligibility was updated to 2018 from 2016. The allocation formula includes unemployment, uh, labor, non-participation, and of course the age-adjusted rates of drug overdose deaths. Um, for the first allocation, the program rules and waivers, et cetera, were published in the Federal Register in November of last year, and the round two um, notices in development, though the formula allocations uh, came out in late February. So really, really high level overview of the program. It's organized within the framework of CDBG, as I mentioned. Um, and, you know, as we often talk about with CDBG, there's two 
um, key tests you have to meet, and the Recovery Housing Program adds a third. So the first, of course, is national objectives. With recovery housing, that is um, benefit to low and moderate income persons based on the limited clientele criteria, and those are slightly modified by the notice. Um, you have to have an eligible activity, of course, and um, only those listed in the notice are eligible for recovery housing program funding. And then lastly, um, there has to be a connection to the program purpose, and that is to provide stable temporary housing for individuals in recovery from a substance use disorder. Okay, so now we'll talk about um, some things that you need to do or thought processes you need to go through before you begin your action plan. As those of you who are experienced CDBG grantees know, you don't just sit down and write your action plan. You have to do some work ahead of time. You have to plan and study and engage with stakeholders to be able to write the plan. Um, so many of you are probably well underway with this effort, um, you know, coordinating with partners, evaluating the, uh, what you know, needs to happen before you can begin your action plan, but we'll review some of those considerations. Um, it, it could be a linear process of you know, engaging partners, surveying capacity, and defining who's going to do what. But um, it also could be a feedback loop, and I think you, know, you could start at any of these three points and move to others and refine your activity actions and make decisions um, and then go around again. So you, know, you could start by engaging partners and getting clues on the addiction treatment and recovery landscape within your state. Um, you could also do your own research on who is serving the population, so survey existing capacity starting on your own. Um, and then, or you could start by deciding, you know, what your agency has the expertise to do, um, kind of defining what your own role will be, and then engage with partners to fill gaps. But I think, you know, these three elements will all inform each other um, until you have your decisions nailed down. Okay, um, so for the sake of this webinar, we'll start with um, partner engagement. And, you know, based on my conversations with some states, I know that at least a few of you started here. Um, and we've talked a lot about partnerships already in this series. The last webinar, I believe, some really, really great um, discussion and examples of how, uh, of what partners are out there and how they could be involved. Um, so hopefully you have some ideas about agencies to approach and you've already begun building those alliances. And, you know, I think we even have some partners on the webinar. So um, to those of you that are new to this series, welcome. Um, so we'll begin with partners that could support your administration or maybe even administer the RHP program on your behalf. Um, and as you engage with these partners, you'll also want to test the waters on their interest and bandwidth to be involved in program administration. So, um, you know, really important partners to explore working with are your single state agency, um, and they administer drug and alcohol addiction and services funding, such as the state opioid response grants and substance abuse prevention and treatment block grants. Um, and if you're, so if you're a regular CDBG or housing agency administering a recovery housing program, the single state agency likely has different and necessary expertise that you need at the table. And maybe they have funding they can bring to the table for treatment and services, um, and also they could potentially connect you with other partners. So other agencies to engage at the state and local level um, are some that serve some of the same population. And I think for many of you, you probably already coordinate with some of these agencies, such as the, um, those that run ESG and HOPWA, if you don't do it at your own agency, um, because you have to coordinate on the CPD consolidated planning process. And so um, you, know, you probably have existing relationships with uh, the continuums of care or BASH administrators, um, housing finance agencies, and public housing authorities as well. Um, and then there are also agencies that operate or support recovery housing. Um, and so you know, this is also connected to the capacity survey and something you should be looking at there. But um, if recovery housing exists in your state, um, and in many states it does, uh, you could engage agencies operating or supporting it. Um, 
Also, if your state has a NAR affiliate, they could fit in here. Um, but as a side note, HUD is not endorsing NAR. Um, other potential uh, delivery and funding partners um, are those you know that that do this work or, and may also have additional funding to bring to the table. So they could partner with you on identifying and serving a target population as well. So these could be state and local agencies that administer funding for other wraparound services that would also benefit um, recovery housing participants. Um, so an, an example they give in the notice is um, the Department of Labor um, Workforce Investment um, Funding for employment programs. You could also look at state agencies that administer SNAP, TANF for child welfare, um, your state Medicaid authority, um, Department of Corrections or Community Corrections. Um, you know, think about any other government agencies that might be a little bit further removed from housing and addiction recovery, but they might have resources that could benefit some of the same population, and you could form a mutually beneficial relationship um, with RHP resources. Um, others are state or local nonprofits that operate or support recovery housing. Um, local hospitals and behavioral health clinics, they may have funding to address um, special populations needs. And then philanthropic community or foundations, um, are there any out there whose missions align with that of the recovery housing program? Um, and are they already supporting how health and or housing related efforts? Moving on to existing capacity. So, you know, we talked about this in the notice webinar, but there are several areas of expertise that are needed to administer the recovery housing program. So you can start with your agency and other agencies at the table. Um, what do you have? What is missing? Um, and since the recovery housing program is based on uh, the state CDBG regulations, obviously that base of knowledge is important. Um, and I think in, in many cases, um, you know, the regular state CDBG agency uh, is the one um, designated to administer RHP. Um, and then given the intended population, you also need expertise in addiction services and treatment. Um, and then of course, the way that you will interact with HUD in the planning and reporting system of DRGR, um, you need that expertise. Um, I will say as an aside, um, we're bringing some DRGR TA to this effort um, that we have underway now. Um, also, federal housing programs. So RHP is a housing program, and your agency may or may not have it in-house. So, it, but it's important for activity structuring, um, cross-cutting requirements, um, especially those that are housing specific, like fair housing or Section 504 um, accessibility compliance. And then um, if recovery housing expertise exists in your state, which you know, in, in many it does, um, that's important to know and evaluate. So some of the questions to ask as you evaluate potential key partners for program administration and delivery, um, you, know, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. You want to build upon the expertise and efforts that are already underway in your state. So for other state or even local agencies that address substance use disorder and recovery, um, what kind of funding do they have? Uh, how could it align with RHP? Um, could you potentially review projects together, like a joint underwriting effort, um, to streamline the funding application process and get projects or programs closer to the finish line? Um, as we all know, it can take a long time for a, a project to um, finalize its capital stack. Um, and then think about these agencies, what's their capacity to partner? Um, how much staff do they have? Are they stretched totally thin? Um, or are they well staffed? Um, and at what level of staff can they commit to a joint effort? And then of course, uh, critically, is, is their leadership on board to partner with you? Um, and then would they have the capacity and interest in a subgrant partnership? Um, so could you or would you? subgrant to them, would you consider that? Um, for recovery housing providers, you know, on the delivery side, there are potentially people providing or agencies providing recovery housing now. Um, and as we've talked about a little bit, you know, you, know, you want to evaluate them because there are 
problems that exist with some existing recovery homes um, that aren't well regulated, um, things like patient brokering, which I think we mentioned in an early webinar. So, you know, if recovery housing isn't regulated, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's unethical practices going on, but it's something to keep in mind. As you look at existing recovery homes, uh, you also, you know, investigate whether they're licensed or certified or otherwise have a good reputation. You know, if possible, go visit them, see for yourself. And if you determine that the, the recovery housing is well operated, um, you know, do, do they have the capacity to expand? Could they help you implement your program? Um, and as you get answers to questions like these, and I'm sure the many more that will arise, um, the pieces should start falling into place on your program administration and design. Um, okay, and then finally, uh, determining ad administrative roles. So as you engage with partners and evaluate their capacity, another piece is to nail down your commitments to each other and the program. So who are the lead staff in each agency that has an administrative role? Um, and what will that, that role look like? You know, we've that list of capacity that we need um, is related to this, but you know, who's gonna be responsible for, responsible for developing the action plan and reporting in DRGR? Um, who will be involved in project review and selection? Um, who will execute the written agreements with um, you know, subrecipients or contractors um, and oversee those relationships? Um, and then who will be responsible for ongoing compliance? Um, so make sure that you know, all your bases are covered for a good program and that you have everyone you need at the table. And then you'll you know, start to think about your implementation methods. So um, you have a lot of options with your implementation methods and you don't have to choose just one, you can have a combination. Um, so you know, program administration, do you wanna do it in-house? Do you want to uh, provide a grant to a subrecipient to offer it for you? Do you want to distribute funding um, through a method of distribution? And you know, if you opt for a subrecipient, what is your selection method and criteria? Um, and you know, don't forget the statutory requirement that you include um, evaluation of need and the ability to spend the funds timely in your in your criteria for selection. Um, and then you know, if you select a method of distribution along with performance measures and oversight. Um, how will you determine that distribution framework? Um, and how will you ensure that the communities that will implement the program have the expertise and the information that they need? Okay, the last thing, let's just a note um, before you begin developing the action plan, is um, you likely need to revise your citizen participation plan. So many of you probably did that recently to um, accommodate the COVID-related flexibilities. Um, and if you haven't done this already for a recovery housing, the citizen participation plan should be amended again to incorporate um, recovery housing consultation and citizen participation requirements. So the notice requires consultation with an engagement of organizations interested in residential recovery programs for persons with substance use disorder. Um, and the stakeholders need to have an opportunity to review and comment on the Recovery Housing Program Action Plan before it's submitted. Um, so the revised part citizen participation plan must allow for a minimum of 15 days for public comment on the action plan before you submit. And then, of course, when you amend the citizen participation plan itself, you have to provide a reasonable period for the public to comment on those changes. Okay, now we're going to transition to um, developing the action plan. So Chuck is gonna take us through this part. Take it away, Chuck. There we go. Very good, so um, you're all set to run and uh, we're gonna go through the uh, content and uh, scope of what your action plan is going to look like. So just as a, as a broad overview, uh, your action plan will describe how you're going to use the funds, 
how you're going to select uh, the implementers of the uh, activities that you're going to fund with your RHP funds, and how all that relates to providing uh, focused on temporary housing for persons recovering from substance use disorder. So that's the, uh, the general scope. Uh, what we're going to do in the, in the following is go through, uh, in the order that is presented in the uh, RHP notice, the 12 elements that will eventually comprise your action plan. Uh, I wanted to uh, direct your attention to a couple of things first before we, we jump into that. Uh, first, uh, there's a, a pretty good general overview of the process from uh, starting the consultation to uh, submitting and, and implementing your program. It's in the notice, an early part of the notice uh, uh, on page 16 of that uh, notice that you see, it's already part of the uh, the uh, version that you see on the HUD exchange. So that would be a good starting place to review the steps in that sequence of uh, developing your action plan. Another thing I want, want to point out uh, from a very practical standpoint, and I think Carrie mentioned this already, the deadline is August 16th for submitting the action plan. So as you think about the individual steps, the kind of consultation that uh, Carrie described, uh, the formulation of a plan for uh, project selection, uh, you'll need to be working backwards from uh, August 16th uh, to get that action plan in uh, on time. So we're gonna start now uh, just looking uh, through the uh, 12 steps, 12 items that HUD has presented. And uh, of course, uh, there should be any uh, technical issues in completing the uh, standard form 424. Uh, but going, moving along, the uh, first piece of your program summary, and a lot of this is going to be a narrative that you uh, you draft up as you uh, formulate this uh, this action plan. And this program summary may be something you come back to at the end of your process and write up as a concise summary. Uh, I don't want to jump ahead to the to the uh, uh, project examples that we're going to be discussing in a moment, but uh, it could be you know, something very concise describing several housing development projects or uh, several uh, resident subsidy projects that you've decided to fund. Just summarize the outcome of your project selection process here. And that will complete the first two of the 12-step uh, process. It's funny that uh, HUD came up with a 12-step process for the action plan. So, so the, uh, the third item is uh, list the additional resources. Now these, uh, uh, we can get carried away a, a little bit uh, with uh, talking about the funding of the services that will go along with your recovery housing program. But I think what we're focusing more on is uh, you're going to be, your projects are going to be providing housing, uh, either through subsidizing the tenants or through some kind of housing development effort. So those are the resources we're looking. In addition to your RHP funds, which uh, on an annual basis range from just under a million to uh, you know, looks like uh, about a million and a half per year. Uh, in addition to those funds, what are you going to bring to the table to carry out this housing development uh, effort? The administrative summary uh, is the summary of your administrative organization. How is the CDBG agency, what role are they going to play? What is your uh, single state agency that administers the SAMHSA grants if they're involved? What role will they play? Do you have a joint task force to carry out the uh, project selection uh, process that you've established? What, what are the roles and responsibilities of these uh, agencies? If you've uh, Formalize that through an interagency agreement uh, or a memorandum of understanding 
or involved, uh, as uh, Carrie suggested, uh, some uh, groups, uh, nonprofits that are uh, uh, like like NAR or similar uh, agencies that are uh, committed to serving persons with substance use disorder. If they have a role, you'd want to identify their role and how they're involved in the process at this point in your action plan. So this uh, next uh, section uh, really gets into the, the heart of this. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the state CDBG program, and I think that's most of you on the call, but there are some who are, uh, I think, from the uh, substance use disorder field and uh, work with the programming of uh, assistance for recovery housing. Uh, they find this a new term. Basically, uh, the states who are receiving these uh, recovery housing funds typically function by distributing the funds directly to units of general local government. And their typical CDBG uh, uh, process involves distributing those funds to local governments that normally don't receive their own direct allocation from HUD of community development block grant funds. Here uh, in, in the recovery housing program as a uh, variation on the, the standard approach, the state, or I think we have our folks from DC, I hope they're on the line, uh, but all the other uh, RHP grantees are state governments, and I guess our DC folks are hoping to be a state government soon too, but in any event, uh, unlike the, the general method of distribution which focuses on cities outside of CDBG entitlement jurisdictions, the entire state could be the uh, uh, purview of your recovery housing program allocations. And this is very specific where the state would allocate the funds to a unit of local government or we don't want to forget potentially to a tribal government or a tribal housing authority. Uh, all of these are authorized recipients of funds distributed by the state. In effect, what we're doing is we're creating another tier in the implementation process. Uh, my thought might be that this might be part of a program, but in general, moving right along, because the recovery housing program provides a, the option that the state can undertake the distribution and the awarding of these funds directly, unlike CDBG funds where the, the award goes to the unit of local government, the state through the CDBG agency or the through the uh, uh, agency that uh, works in the substance use disorder field would award the funds directly to the provider of those services, the entity that would be expanding its housing stock or subsidizing its, uh, its, uh, its residents. So, my suspicion, and maybe we can uh, get some feedback on this at some point, that more often than not, the state will take advantage of this uh, option to undertake direct implementation. This is uh, on the order of uh, what, what occurred with the uh, neighborhood stabilization program, which was uh, provided housing for uh, funding in, re in relation to the, uh, the, uh, the foreclosure crisis in the in the 2008-2011 period. So we're anticipating that many states in cooperation with their substance use agency will directly be involved in awarding funds, including funds to agencies that will be operating within the locality of cities and counties that are receiving their direct CDBG allocations, but they are not recipients of recovery housing program funds. So in describing your method of distribution or describing how you will undertake direct implementation, direct implementation, you will want to describe who these eligible subrecipients are and what the threshold criteria are. Uh, and uh, this is an appropriate point to remind us that uh, we have some uh, fairly strict uh, limitations on implementation requirements. And since you'll be expected to expend 
30% of the funds within 12 months of the award of the grant from HUD, one of your threshold criteria should consider how you're going to implement in a timely fashion and meet that 30% expenditure deadline in the first year. So that suggests that uh, a, an entirely new entity uh, just being formulated that uh, doesn't have uh, currently any direct experience but is just uh, getting going, that there may be a threshold criteria where timely implementation uh, will be a threshold requirement. So from your method of distribution or the process that you uh, undertake to distribute the funds directly to uh, the providers of recovery housing, uh, you will be governed then by two uh, overriding statutory priority criteria. You will look at uh, entities where there's the greatest need for recovery housing and entities with the ability to deliver effective assistance in a timely manner. And again, this ties into the 30% uh, uh, requirement for expenditures in the first 12 months. And if you have other evaluation criteria, this is, uh, you state that as part of your method of distribution or the uh, uh, direct allocation process that you've established. Uh, additional element in the required action plan is, is a couple of specific definitions that you'll have to uh, work through and adopt. Uh, the first of which is uh, what is an individual in recovery? Uh, we have here uh, an adaption from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, this is their definition of recovery. and. Uh, We also have the perspective that uh, recovery is a process that involves four dimensions in support of uh, recovery. It's health, home, and we're providing the housing part of the home environment for the person in recovery. Uh, purpose, achieving purpose in uh, future direction and in the community and allowing the individual to function within the community as an effective participant. So the first definition, we we're talking about individual and recovery. And then another definition, what is a substance use disorder? And the caveat included here is that uh, we're not going to, uh, this uh, program cannot limit to a specific type of substance use disorder. We know that it comes in a variety of dimensions and a variety of uh, of aspects, uh, a variety of, variety of substances, which uh, can be uh, uh, incidences of use disorder. So here's a couple of samples for you to consider. One from the uh, from SAMHSA, uh, and the one from the Mayo Clinic. And you'll note that uh, the Mayo Clinic. Uh, shows that, um, and this was some part of my education as I came to the uh, recovery housing program, that uh, we're, we're generally using the term substance use disorder. And uh, I think just to to recognize uh, that the individuals and the people we're working with uh, are, uh, they have a disorder, uh, they're, they're people who deserve our respect and uh, who, uh, we're trying to uh, achieve uh, through uh, stable housing to provide a, a suitable environment for them to overcome this use disorder that they're uh, that they're working with. And then, uh, not to uh, be to this uh, over much, uh, there has to be an expenditure plan to meet the deadlines, and uh, also an administrative cap. Uh, those of you who work with the state CDBG program are familiar with the uh, administrative cap, uh, but this is, uh, the, for RHP, it's somewhat different. It's a 5% total administrative cap from the entire grant. There's no match required for administrative funds. So 
So that's uh, good news for uh, some of the, uh, the managers of, of your, your agency that uh, within the 5% limit, there's 100% coverage of your administrative costs. So then we come to outcomes. Uh, the statute and the uh, recovery housing program notice dictate two mandatory outcome measures, uh, the number of individuals assisted and the number of individuals transitioning to permanent housing. Uh, note that uh, as we've covered in the past, uh, recovery housing is a time limited uh, program that no individual resident uh, can stay longer than two years. It's a maximum of two years for any individual. There are other uh, program outcome measures that you may uh, choose to uh, associate. Uh, it may be those similar to those in the uh, homeless program, the continuum of care in terms of uh, income and uh, other uh, kinds of uh, progress measures for the individuals that, that are participating. But uh, these there are two uh, mandatory ones. When you come to draft then your final action plan, you'll have a process, uh, you'll be describing in summary form, this is in participation. You'll describe how you uh, obtained citizen input, what comments you received, and what uh, uh, responses you provided to the comments. Uh, either uh, that they were incorporated, the comments and suggestions were incorporated into your final program, or uh, whether they were not accepted because they were, for whatever reason, uh, not feasible to be accepted. Uh, involved expenditures that were ineligible or uh, exceeded the, the budget of eligibility or for whatever reason, uh, a particular suggestion was not considered. You'll also describe the public hearing uh, and uh, believe that uh, we're still uh, allowing virtual public hearings uh, to meet the citizen participation requirements for the recovery housing program. And uh, you know the point is that uh, this whole process is uh, going to be uh, on a separate track more or less from the standard community development block grant uh, annual action plan uh, development process. So this will all be a standalone for recovery housing program. You will summarize then uh, the partners that you have uh, both at the federal and uh, local level uh, who are you see those that are receiving federal funds in assisting substance use disorders. That is the uh, the, uh, the opioid recovery grants and uh, these uh, substance abuse treatment grants, uh, which partners have you involved in your recovery housing program? Finally, or near finally, I think, uh, your action plan will address how you will do oversight and monitoring. Uh, I would expect that most of the C, all the CDBG agencies have a, an existing plan for their oversight and management process. And uh, a convenient approach would be to uh, really add the recovery housing program. And this may be a new dimension uh, for most of the uh, state CDBG uh, administering agencies. You're going to become involved with some new partners and some new entities that you probably haven't worked with in the past. So. Uh, Recognizing that this recovery housing program will be part of a, a larger scope of responsibility for sub recipient management and monitoring, uh, addressing this item by adding and incorporating that into your overall process would be uh, an appropriate uh, way to address that. And then finally, uh, or next to last, uh, pre award costs. Uh, the uh, recovery housing program is very generous in, in awarding. Uh, and recognizing reimbursement for pre-award and pre-agreement costs. And here's where you would describe what costs you're going to be seeking uh, that pre-award reimbursement. And I guess uh, the, the time spent on the webinar today would be uh, part of the time that you might uh, want to have uh, reimbursed from the, from the grant. And this would probably count towards your 5% administrative costs.
And then finally, the 12th item, uh, we've listed here a series of certifications. Uh, there's a, it goes on for several pages in the uh, recovery housing plan notice. Uh, but th these are all the, cert they're basically promises of compliance that you'll make. Uh, and if there are any particular questions, uh, most of these should be familiar to uh, the CDBG uh, agencies. Uh, Everything from environmental review and lead paint and Section 3 in the Uniform Act, uh, certifying that you have the legal authority to undertake the program. And this will be just a, a comprehensive listing with a final catch all other applicable laws. So, those are the 12 elements that will comprise the uh, uh, action plan that you draft. Uh, it will uh, likely then uh, include the selected activities uh, and uh, they will be uh, identified and described in, uh, uh, I don't want to go down the hole of getting too deep into DRGR, but you will, then this, there's a whole section where you just enter your narrative uh, responses to these items on the action plan and then you will complete uh, projects and activities with budgets and outcomes uh, for the individual selected uh, activities that you'll be carrying out with your recovery housing program funds, with one activity typically being uh, always being your administrative activity, which will be the, the mechanism by which you'll recover uh, your state uh, administrative costs up to the 5% limit. So there we are. Um, Gary, can I return turn the ball to you? Great, thanks, Chuck. Okay, so now we'll talk a little bit in the abstract, so just conceptually about program implementation. Um, so depending on the decisions you make in your existing processes, at least the first two steps in this timeline, um, in this flow chart, I guess, may happen in parallel with the steps you take before and during the action plan. So this, you know, it's hard to present a circular <laughs> webinar, um, but, you know, these things might be happening at the same time. Um, and, you know, as we just heard from Chuck, the action plan requires a lot of detail on what you intend to fund, what other funds are coming to the table, who you're working with, expected outcomes. So, you know, that leads to the conclusion that you should be pretty far along in your program design and even project selection by the time you submit your action plan. In addition, you know, given the tight timeline that, that Chuck emphasized, to spend the first 30% of the funds within a year of execution of your grant agreement with HUD, it's wise to have activities lined up and ready to go to sign that written agreement with them as soon as you have access to your RHP funds. So we'll go through these steps um, quickly, but the hope is by the time that you get to implementation, you've laid out a really good framework for yourselves, you've done all that planning ahead of time, the action plan has really walked you through all of the things that you need to consider and flesh out um, so that, you know, this should go smoothly and of course, there are always unexpected twists and turns um, in, in program implementation, um, but uh, hopefully those are minor and you can deal with them as they come up. So once you've determined your administrative roles, as we talked about, you know, before doing the action plan, um, you want to formalize those relationships with a written agreement. Um, and so depending on, you know, your state's practices or district's practices and what your arrangement looks like, it could be like an agent, an interagency agreement or intergovernmental agreement, um, maybe a memorandum of understanding. And in that you want to make sure you clearly define who is doing what, what responsibilities each will have and make sure they're all covered. So, um, you know, go back to that list of sort of roles that, that need to be filled. Um, you also want to establish your timelines and what you want to accomplish and when, and then you know, determine both the scope and frequency of your communicating and reporting to one another, and then also, you know, as you get into oversight of subrecipients or contractors, um, how that monitoring and reporting will be conducted, who's going to do that. 
Um, so project selection, um, as I said a moment ago, this may also occur before you submit your action plan. Um, and ideally, uh, part of your administrative role determinations before you submit your action plan or even um, complete it include planning for your project selection process. So um, you or your partners could publish a NOFA or other process consistent with your selection criteria, the eligibility you've defined, everything you've already laid out if you've identified a specific type of recovery housing program, eligible activity that you want to fund, um, or target population. And then um, you want to make sure that um, in that project selection that any applicants um, demonstrate that they can comply with the applicable cross-cutting requirements. Um, so, of course, URA, uh, potentially 104D, um, if there will be any acquisition, um, including leasing, rehab, conversion of, um, of housing, and then if you're developing a facility, um, that's, this is also something to consider. Um, and remember that acquisition of a tenant-occupied property has Uniform Relocation Act and budget implications. Section three is, of course, a consideration if there will be any construction activity. Um, civil rights and fair housing, of course, is applicable to all that we do. Um, Lead-based paint, uh, if any funded buildings uh, could, are possibly um, built before 1978. Uh, of course, environmental review, that's applicable to everything we do as well, but the, the timeline and the level of review will vary depending on the activity. Um, procurement is applicable to subrecipients or applicable to you if you're selecting a contractor rather than a subrecipient um, or funding uh, or distributing funding another way. So you want to review and select your projects, ensure, you know, of course, we all know this, you have approval by your leadership or governing body, um, and then announce your awards. Um, okay, so there's, you know, two kind of written agreements we've talked about, um, you know, uh, and so this is the second, so these would be the written agreements with your funded agencies. So you've selected projects at this point, um, you've developed and submitted your action plan, HUD has approved it and sent your grant agreement, and now you're ready to hit the ground running and implement those projects. Um, so, of course, you know, at the written agreement stage, remember a couple of key cross-cutting considerations. Your environmental review must be complete, um, and you want to ensure compliance with URA um, or 104D. So, you know, all occupants of acquired or rehabbed property um, and owners as well have uh, the required notices, um, referrals, and assistance. And then, you know, you want to include all of the applicable CDBG, recovery housing, cross-cutting requirements within that agreement. Um, and then this is the point at which, um, when, once that's signed, you would set up your activities in DRGR. Um, okay, so once you've uh, funded um, agencies and signed your written agreement, they get going on the project. So at this point, you've hopefully figured out what this will look like ahead of time, right? You have your, you know, a lot of it you have to have in your action plan anyway. So you have your um, oversight uh, and monitoring criteria. You uh, include, you know, the requirements of your selection criteria and, and, you know, oversee those to make sure that they're doing what they promise. Are they meeting their intended milestones on time? Um, if not, do you, is there a risk there? Um, do you need to intervene or provide technical assistance um, to get them back on track? Um, or, heaven forbid, have to um, uh, deobligate money if, or, and terminate the agreement if they're not able to do it. Um, so, you know, as we've said a couple of times, you have tight timelines to meet to ensure you disperse funding in accordance with the statute, so you really want to stay on top of that. Okay, now we'll um, talk about some sample, just hypothetical program designs or implementation. Um, and this is what it could look like in practice. And as we're presenting these, please you know, think carefully. We'll have some poll questions, so think carefully about what um, might apply or if you have 
any concerns about a given program design. So the first one, you have a state recovery housing program grantee, and they've engaged with their single state agency and decided to partner with them. Um, they'll evaluate applications together, and uh, the state agency with RHP will bring um, the recovery housing funding, and the single state agency will bring um, the services funding. So they review applications together through a NOFA process, and that results in an award. One of the awards they give to a private nonprofit subrecipient uh, to complete acquisition and minor rehabilitation of an occupied residential rental property. In this case, it's a four-bedroom home. It was built in 1950, and they plan to operate it as recovery housing, so a shared housing model. And they will target individuals with substance use disorder who are transitioning from or at risk of homelessness. So now we have a couple of polls. Medora, if you want to open those up. Um, which of the cross-cutting requirements that apply do you expect to be the most challenging um, and require technical assistance either for you or for the subrecipient? So we have environmental review. We'll have to think about you know, the, what's the appropriate level for an acquisition rehab and minor rehab project. Um, lead safe housing, since the home was built before 1978, um, we have to think about lead safe paint, lead based paint. <laughs> um, you know, relocation, um, since the property is occupied by tenants. Uh, where do they go? What happens there? And then finally, section three, um, the rehab is a um, construction activity. So go ahead and, and vote on what you think will be the hardest one. Okay, the poll has ended, so we're just waiting for the results to come up. There we go. Okay, so it seems like of the folks that uh, responded, the most popular response was relocation. Um, I agree that's always challenging, making sure that you have the required notices at the right time. Um, often in, in many of our mar housing markets, um, they're pretty tight, so it can be difficult to find um, replacement housing um, if you're relocating people permanently. Um, oh, environmental review, people also thought would be challenging. Uh, and then um, Section 3, I, you know, we have a new rule, um, and it, it has um, some different outcome measures and performance measures, so, um, you know, I anticipate challenges with that. Um, Chuck, do you have anything to add on what you see here? About as expected. Uh, I think um, I think most people have been trained on the lead safe housing rule, so this just needs to uh, follow that uh, that process and hire people who know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's see what we think about what what might be hard or what the requirements of the lead safe housing rule are. So, Medora, can you open our second poll? So compliance with the lead safe housing rule does not require that you use safe practices in conducting remediation, determine if the structure was built before 1978, conduct final clearance testing, or determine lead content of paint based on taste. This one should be pretty quick. <laughs> All right. 
Now we're just waiting for the results. Okay, so most, most people that uh, answered got it, and that is no, you are not required to determine the lead content of paste based on paste, um, but all of the other um, pieces are required. And then the last poll on this activity, on this uh, sample implementation, um, is uh, what does the Uniform Relocation Act require? Um, A, the determination of fair market value of the property to be acquired. Um, do you have to determine relocation eligibility based on the date of initiation of negotiations? Um, are you required to provide displaced persons with decent, safe, and sanitary comparable replacement housing? Or all of the above? Okay, the poll has ended, so we're just uh, waiting for the results. Okay, all of the above, correct. Okay, so um, digging in a little bit more on this example, um, so the, the partners and the expertise and responsibilities that they bring to the table. So you have, in this case, it's the State Economic Development Department that is the CDBG, regular CDBG grantee, and they were designated um, by the governor to also receive recovery housing program funding. And their expertise are those CDBG program requirements, as well as recovery housing program requirements, um, federal cross-cutting associated with CPD funds, and then DRGR. Um, the single state agency um, brings knowledge on addiction services and treatment. Um, and then the subrecipient itself has expertise in recovery housing and federal housing and homelessness programs. And this is something I often, you know, remind myself, I guess, or maybe as a compliance person, I could be a control freak, but our funded partners have a lot of knowledge and expertise themselves, and we don't necessarily have or need all of that. Um, you know, we should let them do what they know how to do, and we just have to have have to know enough um, to ensure that they meet program requirements. So we have to know our program requirements and then sort of work with them um, to to implement and help them navigate. Um, any challenging cross-cutting requirements such as URA or environmental. Um, okay, in this, uh, we came up with some sample budgets, what those could look like. So this is a, you know, pretty small budget for a development project, but it's acquisition and rehab of a, a single large home, so it's to be expected. Um, so acquisition costs are pretty straightforward. Um, you know, the, the rehabilitation will likely include lead paint testing or presumption, risk assessment and abatement given the size of the HUD investment plus any other um, upgrades that are identified to be needed. Um, because we have to relocate the tenants, um, we could budget you know, up to, well, in this case, we looked at it and we're budgeting $30,000. Um, you also have to you know, cover professional fees. Um, and then uh, project management, the subrecipient is offering that in kind. They've done this activity before and they have that capacity in house. Um, and then you, know, you have some soft costs associated with it. And then finally, the capitalized operating reserve, um, the local government has come to the table to help support that. Okay. Just a uh, point, oh. quick point on the, re on the rehabilitation. Uh, remember that you're going to have to perhaps do some reconfiguring of the property to serve as a recovery housing unit. Uh, there may be some reception areas, some security features. So 
when you, you think about rehabilitation, think about the specific reuse and make sure you budget appropriately for that. Good point. Thank you. Um, okay, so an annual operating budget. Um, this subrecipient, you know, they serve this population, people experiencing homelessness that have substance use disorder, and they have access to sufficient continuum of care funds to dedicate to this project to um, cover most operating expenses. Um, and it's likely needed given the low anticipated income of, of residents, especially when they first move in, you're not going to have a lot of rental income. Um, so you'll likely need another source to make sure that the property can cash flow. Um, so these cover admin expenses, general operating expenses such as utilities, and you'll have maintenance costs for things like repairs and landscaping, of course taxes and insurance, and then um, as I mentioned the replacement reserve. Um, or sorry, I had mentioned the operating reserve before. In this case the replacement reserve um, to ha uh, squirrel money away um, for any upgrades or repairs that the property needs that go beyond regular maintenance. Okay, and then the annual services budget. Um, this is where the single state agency comes in, but uh, those uh, funds could also potentially be Medicaid eligible. Um, so, you know, you've got case management and peer support. Um, drug testing is a very common um, component of recovery housing programs and um, can be quite expensive, actually. Um, they, they may be doing it on a weekly or twice weekly basis. Um, transportation, food, and miscellaneous. And, and anyone you know familiar with the services needed, there are some others in here. Um, but many times the case manager will have relationships and refer residents to other services such as um, uh, you know, employment uh, services or um, education, healthcare, those things. Um, and you know, this established nonprofit has relationships with philanthropy um, and so has ongoing donations and they can dedicate some of that revenue to this. Okay, so you'd have, you know, two written agreements associated with the first, of course, would be with the single state agency, and that would have happened, you know, even before the action plan, hopefully you've nailed down what your roles and responsibilities are going to look like. Um, and then, you know, we're using a subrecipient model because based on polling from earlier webinars, most states anticipate acting directly or through subrecipients. Um, so uh, in your subrecipient agreement, you'd want to make sure you include your recovery housing program specific requirements, such as expenditure deadlines and cross-cutting requirements. Um, and then as well, project specific requirements, such as scope of work, budget, um, your timeline and milestones, tenant selection, reporting, monitoring response. I think you know, these are things that folks familiar with HUD funding, CDBG funding, you probably already have um, a written agreement drafted um, for those programs. I know that if I were um, if I were implementing this program, we would probably start with our existing CDBG subrecipient or, or you know agreement with UGLUGS that then have to uh, that then work with subrecipients. Um, we would uh, take a look at that agreement and um, use that as a starting point. Okay, um, so your implementation steps, once they're funded, um, these are pretty consistent with um, regular CDBG as well. You'd have you know, your project startup activities, so ensuring um, that you've got adequate financial controls in place um, and that you know, all, re all cross-cutting requirements are met or underway, such as those we mentioned earlier that have um, early trigger dates, environmental and URA. Um, and then, of course, executing your written agreement. Um, and then, you know, given that this is a real property activity, we're acquiring property, um, you could record a deed restriction to ensure that um, the RHP requirements run with the land for the period agreed upon. 
Um, and at this point, you'd also set up the activity in DRGR. Um, and then ongoing project management reporting and oversight. So you'd manage the contract in accordance with your written agreement. Um, in, in Colorado, we had, you know, a single staff person who was assigned um, by region to manage um, written agreements associated with their area. So it would, I think, be a, a good way to go. Um, provide, that person provides technical assistance as needed, um, reviews reports, evaluates and approves payment requests, um, and conducts on-site and desk monitoring. Um, and that should be consistent with the level of risk associated with the project. Um, in this case, I think it's a pretty high capacity um, subrecipient, so there may not be a lot of risk, but um, especially initially, you want to make sure that those assumptions are correct. Um, and then once the development activities are complete and the money is, the RHP funds are spent, um, you'd conduct your closeout uh, activities and close out monitoring, um, get the reports that you need, and then um, ongoing monitoring, you know, while not required by CDBG, um, it's a best practice and you want to do it as needed for the compliance period agreed upon. So with um, CDBG, it's typically a minimum of five years, but you could require longer. Okay, so sample program implementation number two, and I really want you to think about if any, if you see any um, red flags with this or if there's anything that concerns you. So the state RHP grantee has decided to partner with um, the National Alliance for Recovery Residences, uh, the state affiliate, to evaluate applications. The NOFA process results in an award to a private nonprofit recovery housing program for rental assistance to new and existing tenants. The target population is low-income individuals with substance use disorder that need financial assistance for recovery housing until they are stable and employed. So here's our last poll question, um, but these uh, answers go into the chat, um, or Q&A box, I guess. Um, so, what are some key considerations or potential issues that you could see with this sample um, program implementation? Oh, I see we have a we have a poll specific that allows open-ended answers. Great, thanks, Medora. And we're going to talk through this Carrie, example. Well, oh, go ahead. Okay. Carrie, I was just thinking while folks are writing that in, maybe I could ask a couple of questions that have come into the Q&A. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, one of them is, does RHP require an environmental review? Yes, it does. Um, and that's one um, cross-cutting requirement. You know, there are many, but HUD didn't make any changes to environmental review requirements. so the the environmental review level would be consistent with um, with the activity. Okay. So, you know, and another if you're building new construction, it's a full um, environmental review. If it's, uh, I think in the case of this acquisition rehab, it might be a categorically excluded subject to or not subject to. I'd no. have to look at the dollar amount. Probably subject to, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Another question is, are we suggesting that projects or activities be selected before entering an action plan in DRGR? Yeah, and um, I actually had this conversation with HUD, so if uh, you have anything to add, um, please feel free. But, you know, just looking at the requirements of, and the specificity that needs to be in the action plan, um, it's, it is, it may, you may have to select projects, but it's probably a good idea. Otherwise, you know, you'll end up amending your action plan after the fact, um, and at, at that point, you know, you have your grant agreement and it might be difficult to spend your money on time if you haven't selected projects. Um, I don't know if Corey or Robert has anything to add. Uh, this is Chuck, I think, I, I think if you're just doing a method of distribution that you might, might have an action plan that did not have the selection of projects at, the, at that point. 
but otherwise, especially with with direct action, uh, you should be in a process in a position to describe the specific projects you've selected. Yeah, this is this is Corey, um, and, and the notice does say that the notice says that if uh, grantees are carrying out activities directly, then the action plan requires a description of the eligible activities that they're going to be carrying out. Uh, so there's that distinction between um, when grantees are carrying out activities directly or when they're awarding them to, to communities by, by an MOD or through another method. Great, thank you, Corey. Hi, Carrie. I just wanted to jump on to say that I closed the poll and participants can now submit their responses into the Q&A box. Okay, great. All right, we didn't get, I guess it was, they weren't that obvious. I guess that's good um, for us to talk through. Um, do we wanna, maybe we talk through this and then I think we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, Okay, so we've highlighted in red maybe some of the um, things that you'd want to consider. Um, so the state RHP has decided to partner with the National Alliance for Recovery Residences state affiliate to evaluate applications. I think we need to understand what that relationship looks like because NAR is not um, a, you know, it's not a public agency, um, it's a nonprofit. Um, some um, recovery residences work with NAR and get a certification um, and NAR does some oversight with them but you know if you had some recovery residences that are certified some that are not you know could there be a conflict of interest there on NAR's part if they're evaluating applications would they favor those that they already have relationships with um, and then another piece is um, specifically the state's engagement with NAR are what, how much is NAR doing? Are they going to be running the program on their behalf? And if that case, in that case, you know, they would likely need to be procured. Um, or if you, if they're awarded a sole source contract, you'd have to, um, you know, justify that and document your rationale. Um, or are they, you know, just like a non-paid subject matter expert with, um, with an interest and, in, you know, uh, in this, in this, type of work. Um, and then another piece, a, a sort of a little tricky piece in here, um, is that the uh, nonprofit intends to assist new and existing tenants. Um, and while, you know, regular CDBG um, so public services have to be an expansion of a service paid for or offered by the, the grantee, um, in this case, um, the notice talks about it has to be an expanded service, period. It doesn't, it doesn't specifically say by whom. So you'd only the new tenants would be eligible. Only an expansion in the number of people served would be allowed. So we've made uh, some changes to sort of clean this up a little bit. So um, the State Recovery Housing Program grantee decides to partner with the NAR State Affiliate. Um, NAR's role will be to provide subject matter expertise at no cost to the state. And this is the case in some, some states that all of the recovery housing providers are NAR certified. So there wouldn't be a real or perceived conflict of interest because, you know, NAR wouldn't favor one over the other based on affiliation. Um, and then the nonprofit would be increasing the number, number of people served. Okay, I think that's it for the presentation. Um, we can go back to the questions. Great. Thank you, Carrie. Um, one of the questions that I have here is, um, has any state submitted their RHP action plan yet? And if yes, would HUD be willing to share it? If not, for the Housing Trust Fund, HUD came out with a sample allocation plan. Would HUD be willing to do that? I think that's a question for HUD, so I don't know if Corey or, or maybe Aaron wants to respond. Yeah, this is Corey. Um, no, no state has submitted their action plan yet, um, so we don't have any to share if we were to do that. Um, 
we can consider that um, sharing the action plan, uh, but we do have some peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, technical assistance that ICF is going to provide in the coming months. So I don't know whether that might be kind of the first order in terms of sharing um, kind of grantee experiences and grantee um, kind of action on the um, designing and implementing the program um, rather than sharing a, an action plan, but we can we can look into to sharing one uh, when it becomes available. This is Robert. Uh, we, we currently share under the annual CDBG program and other CPD programs your consolidated and annual action plans. Those are currently shared on the HUD exchange. Uh, so we we don't have any reason to, to not share it. Uh, so it shouldn't be a problem. I think you know, one of the things that may be uh, useful in responding to that request is, is even prior to the actual final action plan being drafted up, if somebody has established a some kind of NOFA or uh, process for seeking proposals from uh, actual providers of recovery housing, uh, that that might be uh, a useful early step in the process. Thank you. Another question that we've received is, can a state determine who they will award funding to based on data and the ability to carry out the grant in a timely manner without putting together a review committee to determine who to award funds to? There aren't really prescribed requirements around selecting subrecipients. Um, you know, HUD can speak to this a little bit more um, I think in, in in Colorado we had you know, doesn't get RHP funding, but though CDBG doesn't have specific requirements around selecting a subrecipient, the state itself had grant competition requirements that we had to follow. So um, I would take a look at that, and I would, then I would also think about you know fairness or how you're going to ensure that you select the best projects. Um, and there could be other ways, but there isn't a required. Um, subrecipient selection process. Contractors, they would have to be procured. I think that's a key point, Carrie, that uh, if you enter into a contractual relationship, your own rules uh, might force you to go into a formal procurement process. But otherwise, uh, typically, the selection of grant recipients is not necessarily considered by itself. That process is not defined as a procurement. Thank you. Um, and I believe the last question we've got in our queue is uh, what is the minimum or maximum amount to apply for? So I think that will be, that could be determined as part of your, the state's program design. Um, you know, they could set those minimums and maximums. Um, of course, you know, grantees can't, um, can't promise any more funding than they have. So the absolute max would be the allocation. Um, you know, of course, you need to make sure you have funds for administration and potentially technical assistance. Um, but the recovery housing program itself doesn't have a requirement or a cap on um, how much one project could apply for. That would be determined at the state or district level. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, and those are all the questions we have in the queue at the moment. If anyone has any other questions, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A box. We have, you know, some resources as well. Um, links will be live on this. Is uh, posted on the HUD exchange, um, but the HUD exchange does have a recovery housing program page. Um, and of course, then there's some uh, great resources on some of the key cross-cutting requirements that could apply 
um, environmental review and relocation, as we already talked about, will, could be challenging, um, as well as lead-based paint. And Chuck, did you have something to add? Oh, I, I thought we just uh, you know, might mention uh, that in addition to the 5% administrative costs, uh, of course, HUD is paying for ICF to provide technical assistance, but there's a in the uh, RHP, there's an additional allocation of a 3% uh, for uh, technical assistance that a state grantee or the district might purchase uh, with uh, that additional part of their RHP grant. And we've got a few more questions that just came in. One was, will copies of the slides be sent to participants? Copies of the slides will be posted on the HUD Exchange website in about a week. So they'll be available there as well as a recording of this session. The next question we got is, if we received FY20 and FY21 allocations, can we combine into one AAP? This is Corey. Um, that uh, that will be addressed in the um, the second notice that will come out um, that we're going to publish this year, hopefully in the coming uh, coming month or two. Um, that will address how to for grantees that have received two alloc both allocations under FY20 and 21 how to how to submit an action plan. So we're of course, aware of that grantees want that have received two will want to submit one action plan. So, well, we'll notify we'll notify you when that comes out. Okay, and those are all the questions at this time. Um, I think one um, thing to mention, you know, HUD is also um, providing technical assistance. Uh, directly to grantees, so there's a. Uh, I think there have been um, notifications sent out that that's available. That you can now request um, direct technical assistance through um, the HUD Exchange for your recovery housing program. So if you're getting into this stuff and and, and struggling a little bit, um, you have access to direct one-on-one -on -one help um, to support you. Any other final thoughts or notes? I think we can give people five minutes back, four minutes. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. And we'll um, see you on the next one. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you.